Today we'll continue on with sheep and swine diseases. Uh, somebody, j and we'll start with the first slide. Oops, that was the first slide. Here's the first slide. The first slide today is a pituitary of a sheep. It's almost always an old sheep. That means seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, years old and they die suddenly and they have splotchy hemorrhages suggestive of enterotoxemia and if you check them they are dying with enterotoxemia caused by Clostridium perfringens type D. And why the relationship is like that I don't know but uh, I believe this was the first case I saw and you're looking at the bilateral nature of the pituitary hyperplasia. I thought it was a fluke at first, but then if you keep working, here's another sheep, and you've got a great big lump on this side and a big lump on this side of the pituitary in the cella tersica, and you'll say, uh, well, it's a sudden, sudden death sheep, and you wonder why again, and you're going to see splotchy hemorrhage, fluid and fibrin in the heart sac, and it's going to be another classical case of enterotoxemia but there is no overeating associated with this disease in these, in these sheep. And the more sheep you do, older sheep that die suddenly, this is often what you find. Why it's associated with enterotoxemia, Clostridium perfringens type D, I don't have a clue. I just know the association is there. And one of you young pathologists who are looking at this, maybe you should do some research on it. Uh, what I'm really telling you is there's lots of stuff out there for young people to work on that we don't have any clue as to the answer. Uh, this is not an American disease, I beg your pardon, it could be because they do talk of caudria ruminantium in the West Indies. Well this is heart water in, of sheep and you know that when you make this diagnosis this is a fluid level here and they call it uh, heart water. Why the fluid gets there I don't quite understand, probably some vascular impairment, but to make that diagnosis you make, uh, take two slides, cut out a little piece of, of the hippocampus, squish it between the two slides, and then get all that little mass of squished brain tissue on one slide, go to a clean slide and make uh, an impression, pick it up a little bit, stretch the vessels, touch down again, pick it up stretch the vessels, and then look in the vessels for the organisms in the vessels. Uh, this is a sheep's liver, uh, lamb's liver, and you're looking at these umbilicated lesions. Those are classical umbilicated lesions in the liver of sheep with Campylobacter, abortion. So these are lambs that have, uh, sheep that have aborted, and this is a lamb from one of them. I'm not sure it's characteristic of Campylobacter because for years I was taught that, I was shown that, and many of the cases I have seen have been that. However, I have seen others with pure Pasteurella infection make the same thing, same type of gross lesion, so I'm stuck. Uh, and this is a good expression, or it reminds me of a good expression I use for young people starting in pathology, and that is publish your books while you're young when you know all of the answers. Because when you get a little bit older, as I am and others, you're, you're less confident and less cocky about what you know because you've seen too many things that are, uh, aren't, what they're aren't what they're supposed to be. And then you're stuck when you start publishing it. That's to be differentiated from this one here. These little white spots, those are just this is a post-mortem change, multifocal areas of autolysis. Bacteria have come from the gut, the portal circulation, uh, in the manipulation of the sheep to get it to the post-mortem room. And then these bacteria, uh, when they've gotten to the, from the gut to here, they make little pale areas of absolute autolysis. Sometimes they're loaded with gas, sometimes the liver is not loaded with gas. All organisms don't produce gas uh, in an autolytic liver, but that's just autolysis.
Another lesion commonly mistaken by everybody. And you know, this whole series that I'm giving in this group is uh, uh, our species and uh, not necessarily uh, related to the organs. However, sheep commonly have this lesion, but other animals do too, uh, or this change. And this is another uh, post-mortem change where the heart was laying on this side of the liver and on this side of the lung and compressing that part of the lung so that you have a, uh, an acquired change, uh, just atelectasis. Uh, but it didn't occur anti-mortem, so it is a post-mortem change. Not very significant. Another nice lesion you see in, in uh, sheep is all species is this lesion here, maybe a little bit here. And that's an incomplete subaortic stenotic ring. It is the single most common heart anomaly of all animals put together. It's usually over here or it might be anywhere along this line, but incomplete. There's a discussion on them uh, as to how significant they are, and I told you they're really not significant most times. This black pigment that you see in the aorta is normal melanosis and you see it in sheep and goats commonly and quite consistently. It is not a pathological change, it's anatomical variation. This is a neat lesion and it's almost like the lumps I showed you the other day, probably the first slide in this series of sheep. If you have a lump in the throat of a sheep and for any reason you anesthetize them or handle them so they can't breathe properly, any obstruction in the pharynx or high up can, can kill the animal very rapidly with anoxia. Well, this is a, uh, this is a tumor of the uh, sinuses in older sheep and it's called a respiratory adenocarcinoma. The Germans reproduced it with a, uh, by transmission and I believe they pulled the virus out of it. But it's a tumor in the nose, respiratory adenocarcinoma. It's quite common in some groups of sheep. Uh, they've done most of the work, uh, there's a doctor, Professor Marin in Lyon, Spain, who's done lots of work on this. Here's another one up in the, up in the sinus, and it'll cause these sheep to die quite suddenly. Here's another one, it's a monstrous lesion in the nose, and this is why we take the brains out of every animal we see. Uh, at least at school, we, well, every place I go, we take the brains out. And many times you'll see how these tumors, they are, they're adenocarcinomas, they'll go through the, the skull itself into the brain. <clears throat> and uh, the next is a, uh, there are, there's some young lady in, maybe she's not so young, I've forgotten now, in New Zealand who describes four types of periodontal disease in sheep. Uh, we get periodontal disease and I know the dentists in the, in the world and every place disagree with Dr. Crook at Cornell, but I kind of agree with him. This is probably a calcium uh, vitamin mineral imbalance that's causing this. And he says he can stop it, and he's worked with dentists there doing the research to show that it is a calcium deficiency or imbalance at least. And I think it is too. And then the, the, uh, the supporting structures for the teeth loosen up and the teeth all become loose. There's four different types. Some only affect the incisors, some only affect the molars, and I don't know the the different classifications as I should. Uh, it's just not my interest, so I don't push it too hard. The nice thing, or the difficult thing about it, is in Scotland or other places, uh, they have periodontal disease too. On one mountain, they have periodontal disease very severely. On the next mountain over, none of them have periodontal disease. So this is another reason I think it really is not infectious as much as it is a nutritional problem, and thus I agree with Kruk on that. But I know the rest of the world uh, doesn't believe it, but 
We're not here to tell you what to believe. We're just giving you our opinion. When you look at the uh, sheep's lung, I have to come back to it because uh, you're looking at all these little areas of, that are nice and firm. You have to get close to the lung as that one is. We'll go back and you can see the same lung, but you don't see it well. You have to palpate it. Look at the heart. The fat on the heart says it's a well-nourished sheep, no matter what he has in the lung. And what he has in the lung is all this pink material, and that's called pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, PAP. Most of the time when we see that, that is associated with CAE virus infection. Most of the time we see that in the goats. However, you see it in sheep too, PAP pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. <clears throat> this is South Africa, and look at that University of Pretoria, but look at how severely that heart is affected with white muscle disease. When we see white muscle disease, we call it a vitamin E slash selenium responsive disease. We do not, or at least I do not, uh, except that it's a deficiency disease from the diet. It might be deficiency at the cell level that the cell isn't getting it. But most of the time when we see this, almost without exception, and most of the time when in any species we see it, it's associated with spoiled feed. That means moldy hay or high moisture corn in pigs, uh, moldy silage, or something wrong with the feed that there is a microbiological product in most instances making the vitamin E and selenium unavailable. So it's not really a deficiency in the diet. That means that when you have a whole hay barn full of moldy hay, you get 42,000 tons of hay in the barn or whatever amount you have, I exaggerate a little bit, that you can certainly overcome it by giving the animals more vitamin E and selenium. They're responsive to that. But you should realize that in the hay there is an anti-vitamin E factor developing that's making the E and selenium unavailable at the cell level. Anyhow, that's way to, to think about it. Uh, you see this all over the world. This is in Switzerland. And I believe these are miniature deer or sick of deer or some little deer and they all have white muscle disease. And in my humble opinion, again, anytime you have the, uh, the hoof, hoof stalked in zoos, when they, are, when they have this disease, you can usually blame it on the, on the uh, fellow who buys the feed because he buys this great green hay for his hoofed, hoofed stalk. And if it's green, it must be good. Uh, not knowing that it might not be good and it might be loaded with the anti-vitamin E factor which allows white muscle to develop. And of course you only or almost only see this in young growing animals which have an increased requirement for E and selenium and muscle growth. When you look for white muscle disease and you have minimal lesions and they die and you say, well, why did they die? Because uh, they have so little disease. But remember the sheep I showed you, it's monstrous. How did it live that long to get that bad? And when you have a, a heart, like in this heart here, in the pulmonary outflow tract, this is where you always look, somewhere in this pulmonary outflow tract, for the littlest lesion that you're most likely to recognize with white muscle disease. Here's another little lamekins, and here he's got the same lesion here. Well, that lamekins means little tiny lamb, I guess, uh, just to change the flavor of the talk. Anyhow, you're looking at the lesion here, white muscle disease, and it'll kill him. Now, a nice sequelae to white muscle disease is, you're looking at it here. Here's the heart, and he's got little scattered areas in the heart. And that's okay. Now why it should affect the heart in some species more than the limbs 
uh, in others. You know, you usually hear a stiff lamb disease. Well, that should be their muscles of their limbs. In others, they have uh, <clears throat> the lesion in the heart. <clears throat> but the lesion that you should recognize here that is so important, and it occurs in calves at 16 or 18 weeks that are on a milk replacer, not enough vitamin E and selenium in it, is inhalation pneumonia. And that's what you're looking at here. All of this is a very good, extensive, locally extensive, this side, inhalation pneumonia. Why do they get that? Because although you have the lesion in the heart, you also have it in the muscles of deglutition. And they can't work their larynx properly because they have the disease in the muscles of deglutition. All of you should be especially aware <clears throat> that uh, in 50% of the cases of white muscle disease, you do not see gross lesions. And that means if you don't section, the muscles most likely to be affected, like the swallowing muscles, because every calf has to swallow, every lamb has to swallow. And if you don't look at those muscles, you might miss the lesion histologically. Also, foals, they always have their head down under the mother, tipping their chin way up to nurse. Cows and sheep probably aren't quite that bad. And you better look at the dorsal muscles of the neck to see the white muscle disease in them. But a common sequel to having this disease in these muscles is to get inhalation pneumonia. <clears throat> Uh, so that was inhalation pneumonia, ma massively locally extensive. And these little areas are the small lungworm. You know, the sheep has three, Dictyocollis, Protostrongylus, the middle one, and then Mullarius is what this is in the, uh, the smallest lungworm in the sheep. And lungworms are usually, excuse me, I have to cough. <coughs> <coughs> lungworms are usually specific in their location. So if you had Dictyocollis, I hope I can show you a picture, or this is Protostrongylus, they're usually specific in their location. If you had, uh, but if the animal's been dead any, any length of time, the parasites that are in these uh, airways, because Protostrongylus is an airway parasite, they are not happy there anymore because they're, they're Habitat is cold and getting miserable, so they'll move out hunting for the warm spot. And if they had pneumonia down here, and you see worms down here in the airways, you might erroneously say, well, that's where the worms made that lung lesion. If you're not a good general diagnostic pathologist, you'll make a mistake. <clears throat> and other parasites get in the lung. Anytime you see large areas, kind of locally extensive areas, they might be multifocal, but they're multifocal to locally extensive, and you get a little bit of emphysema associated with them. That's because flukes are migrating through this area. You know they're flukes because of the black pigment. Now black pigment is a hallmark of flukes, and they may be anywhere in the liver, in the diaphragm, in the lung, as you see. So they're not very, uh, they get lost in the body too. <clears throat> if you like uh, toxoplasmosis, I think I got this slide from Dr. Dodd, New Zealand. It's better than mine anyhow. So you're looking at multifocal necrosis in the cotyledon and cotyledon of a, of a placenta, toxoplasmosis. Multifocal necrosis, uh, it can be toxoplasmosis, it could be brucella. I can't tell them all apart, I must section them. <clears throat> this is brucellosis, and it's got some necrosis in the, in the cotyledons, and nice intercotyledonary damage as well. <clears throat> oh, I guess I lost one lesion there. <coughs> This is another liver with massive autolysis. And many people look at it, well, that's not an easy diagnosis. All these multifocal areas, <coughs> <coughs> and 
And this is a massive area of autolysis. This is Coxiella br br Brunetti. Oh, I know how they get these mixed up. My fault. In the placenta, another type. And I'm, I'm not sure of these when I look at them. I cannot tell them all apart grossly. Now this piece of liver is a sheep and it's got facial eczema. And you know the story on that. Everybody tells you about it. You get ryegrass usually. You get a mold growing on it uh, that, put out, that puts out sporodesmin. And sporodesmin uh, damages the liver mostly around the periportal areas and you get fibrosis and liver failure. This is an area of regeneration uh, in that liver. Uh, here's another really chronic case with the same disease. Sporodesmin toxicity from the, the organism, the mold that produces it, is Pithomyces chartarum. Uh, one of these came from Burt Glenn in Oklahoma because they had that there, but most of the, of the uh, sporodesmin facial eczema come from Australia and New Zealand. <clears throat> While in Australia, I had I uh, followed up on many sheep diseases that came to laboratory for for diagnosis. So I went down to this farmer, and he had a whole bunch of sheep. Of these are all related. This one's pretty good size. So is that one. So is that one. So is that one. But these two or three are kind of runts. So what makes runts in Australia? Uh, because here I'm walking through the fields and you can see these kind of two little runty sheep. The big problem that you should see immediately is why aren't they with the rest of the flock? Well, because they're different and something's wrong with them. Uh, they could have been isolated, but they weren't. They just didn't go with the rest of the flock for whatever reason. Well, these have white liver disease, a nice entity. This one is a classic white entity. Uh, white liver disease. He's got uh, skin disease, and here it is. His his ears have photosensitization. He's losing some plant pigments from his eyes, and you're getting the pigmentation because of tearing, and you're getting photosensitization of the nose. Here it is again, up closer. And this is because he's here's the white livers. Well, they all have it actually but these are just a little whiter than these two. White liver disease. When you see this in sheep, uh, I didn't know what it was. It was new liver disease to me as far as when I went to Australia. I had never seen it. While I was down there, however, <clears throat> my wife and I drove to the farms and they have a crop rotation where they grow alfalfa three of the four years that they have these, these pastures uh, with the sheep, they grow alfalfa. But the fourth uh, patch of land, that they do it in fours, they, have, they raise potatoes. And potatoes have an increased requirement, apparently, for cobalt, and they add that to the fertilizer, or they try to. And they put it on the potato fields. <clears throat> and, the, and this is where you see most of the white liver disease in Australia is on those that have potato pastures. So nice liver disease and uh, what you're looking at is the, the uh, portal areas out here have a bile proliferation, a cellular response and there's a new thing here and this is this vacuolization peripherally. When I see vacuolization peripherally I usually think of an aflatoxin or a mycotoxin. <clears throat> And you've got bile proliferation and cellular response. Uh, oops. So I came back to the United States, and I had a whole bunch of little, little sheep that weren't doing too well, and I didn't know why. And it was very interesting that I went out to the farm. And after I looked at the liver slides and said, hey, that might be white liver disease. 
So I go out to the farm in upstate New York, and uh, he's got a few sheep like that. Doesn't affect the whole flock. I don't know why. And what do you think the major business is of this farmer in upstate New York? And this is an honest to God uh, story. The ma his he is the largest potato producer in, I was told, New York and New York's and uh, and New England. <clears throat> but anyhow, there's a relationship. Potatoes, cobalt, white liver disease. Another interesting thing, you can't see it too well, uh, but all these plants are in flower. And the sheep go over there and just eat these flowers. And I've forgotten the name of the silly plant. But when they eat those flowers, they're getting all the nectar, which is glucose. And these guys are dying from enterotoxemia because of all the glucose they're getting, the instant available energy source for the flora and fauna in their gut. <clears throat> and what can happen to them, or if they get too much of this material, uh, they can get lactic acid indigestion, which subsequently allows mold to form to make these target lesions. These are nice target lesions. <clears throat> Uh, when you go into livers, you can have tapeworms in the bile ducts. These are tapeworms in the bile ducts. I think I have to get the focus here. Might be. Well, that's about as good as I can get. I'm sorry. Anyhow, these are tapeworms filling up the bile ducts. When you see these in New York, you know they are not uh, the, the sheep uh, from New York. These came from the West. And many of our sheep are bought in the West, at least Cornell sheep, are bought in the West and they keep them and feed them around uh, in New York. And these are Tysanosoma actinoides, the <coughs> fringe tapeworm that live in the bile ducts. They usually don't do too much harm to our animals. Another great lesion in sheep is in that, oh, but we'll forget it just for the minute. We'll come back to that one. The next thing you're looking at, I showed you this a little bit yesterday, I believe. Not such a good picture, however. You're looking at three sheep that have unilateral shutdown with atrophy of the kidney. Now, this is a new ent entity. Normal, I mean, large size kidney, shrunken, no, normal shrunken, normal is shrunken. They all have the same disease, even the small ones. And that is thin, thin sheep, the breed, uh, the thin sheep, uh, a special breed that have a lot of lambs, that's why they like them. But they also get an Im Im immune glomerulonephritis, kind of tubular nephrosis, more in my mind, but we don't argue that. Uh, and it'll damage both kidneys. They die with renal disease with time. But in the meantime, often it will damage to both kidneys at the same time, to the same extent, uh, will result in one kidney shutting down and undergoing atrophy. That's the new entity you should be really thinking about. Don't you dare call that, don't you dare call this hypoplasia. It could be, but how often do any of you see small kidneys one side versus the other when they're born? You really don't. <clears throat> so I don't think you should use that term. Now this is a great disease. This is called hay. That's no problem. But all of the rams, or several of the rams on this farm died because this is eastern New York, and uh, they feed them these big bales. <clears throat> and the rams died, and their bones were hard as brick. They were extremely hard. And they said, well, we're only feeding them grain. I mean, only hay. But they have access to the ewes grain mixture. And when, you're, when you have a bunch of ewes, they're making milk, and you must give them more grain, you know, more calcium and a better supplement than just the hay. 
especially if you keep them, you know, and they're not wild. <clears throat> and you want good production out of them. But if the rams eat it also, and they're not producing milk, where do they put their calcium? They put it into their bones, not into the lambs, because they're not nursing. And you will get the hardest bones that if you try to break them, they're difficult to break. The other interesting thing is that the rams and the two of them from this farm, they get C-cell tumors in the thyroid. And you almost never see them unless their diet is loaded with calcium. And you see it in bulls at the artificial breeding associations where they're getting cow diets. Cows need the milk production, they get the extra calcium, and it'll stimulate C-cell tumors in the older bulls. And the same in these rams. But these rams were only five years old and they had C-cell tumors. And here's all the sheep from this farm. <coughs> They're good, good shape. This is a nice entity. Uh, what you're looking at is the hair here, the skin, is very stretchy. And if you open that up, look at these massive uh, skin is almost peeling off. This is stretchy skin disease. Erlos Danlos syndrome, a lot of lesions, like in sheep, like in cattle. And most of the time this was in merinos, and this is Australia. At least you can tell that by his, the Australians wear shorts. Not too many Americans do, handling sheep. Many Australians wear shorts. I go to the farm, and you see these sheep with all the terry skin. And we, they called it terry skin disease. And here's another one. May they all, lots of them have this. Uh, here it is up around the head. You just play with them. You grab them to uh, look at them, and the, head, the skin will pull right off. It doesn't seem to be that uh, painful, uh, but in the sheep, but anyhow, they sure, they're kind of worthless. And here they are some more. The skin will pull off. I went to the farms, it was quite far away. And I went to the farms, and I asked the guy, uh, well, gee, how do you explain all this? Well, uh, they said it was in the merinos, because that's a fine wool sheep, and they like merino wool, because it's fine wool. But then they said they didn't have it in their dorsets. Well, they didn't have too much in their dorsets, but you could tell if they had any breeding with the merinos. The dorsets had bred any merinos, and that's where they're genealogy table would fit. Because some of the dorsets, all you do is you put your hand, thumbs together on the skin and press down and pull apart and you can tear the skin. Like this. Here's a farmer, he's doing it for me. And here's his hand and he's just stretching the wool and it starts tearing. Now that could be in a dorset or it could be a merino just to show this lesion. And here this guy's doing it again, the same strength and there's no tear in the skin. Doesn't take much. Nice lesion. Uh, uh, well, I'm going to forget those couple in the kidney. I forgot them anyhow. This is a nice lesion. This one belongs to Dr. Delahunter at Cornell, who figured this one out. Uh, this is a uh, goat, whatever. And what you're looking at is these skin lesions like this. Tears, I mean, defects in the skin. For some reason you see these in goats that have paralaphostrongulus. The, the, it's an aborted, it's a related lung worm. It should be in the lung, but lo and behold it's in the spinal cord or in the brain. And it's, a, it's kind of a visceral larval migraines like you get with hookworms in man or dogs or something like that. But usually the worm is in the spinal cord and in some way causes a neurogenic vasculitis, and nobody knows why. Mm -hmm. I this fella gave me a uh, the fella gave me a sheep, a goat, and uh, just a great big fatty liver. You don't see much on it grossly, so that's why you know they invented the microscope. You can't tell, and this is a lesion you see histologically massive hemorrhagic uh, necrosis of the central vein areas. And I said, oh gee, that ought to be um, 
mushroom poisoning, Ammonita phalaroides or some mushroom. And uh, well, lo and behold, the farmer did when we called him up. This is also Australia, but my first cases were in cats uh, that had eaten Ammonita. And if you don't know what it is that you find and you think it's a piece of a mushroom, give it to a mycologist or one of those guys who would know what a mushroom was from a toadstool. They're all alike to me. But I gave it to them and they said uh, Ammonita. But here I went to Australia and the goats got the same lesion. You call up the farmer and he said, yeah, he was eating a puff ball. These great big puff balls that you step on them, the dark cloud of spores come out. Anyhow, that's an interesting lesion and uh, they ate quite a few of them. You can't see this as well as you think you should. Here's a mammary gland and here's an animal that's got a little prolapsed rectum and he's in very poor condition. Here's a healthy little lamb. Uh, this one is not doing too well. So this is Yoni's disease. Uh, mycobacterium pseudotuberculosis and it's a wicked disease in the sheep and cattle and what you're looking at it has such a severe diarrhea it'll get a little bit of a prolapse. The catch on this was it was a dairy farm 18 years ago and the guy had held horses in it for 18 years off and on. Well horses don't get this disease, Yoni's disease but 18 years after the farm had been not, was not being used as a dairy farm, they brought in these sheep. And they brought them in from a clean herd from Pennsylvania, a Yoni's disease free herd, herd from Pennsylvania. So if they bring in uh, disease, you know, specific disease free animals and put them on the, on the, uh, on the premises, now what do you, where did the infection come from? So you happen to ask the farmer, as I did, actually we went rock climbing down by this farm, and you ask the farmer where, where the, uh, what, why did he go out of the dairy business 18 years before? And he says, oh, we had Yoni's disease and they made us, or we were advised to get rid of all of the cows. So does that mean that the organism stayed around in the pens, in the barns, and on the ground for 18 years. It certainly could suggest that. And that is a very difficult disease to eliminate. So I think that might be the answer. And here they got a big prolapsed rectum. They've got diarrhea, of course. Here's another prolapsed rectum because they're, they're diarrheaing all the time with loose stools and those are prolapsed rectums. The only way you're going to help them, you can cut them off, uh, but they've got Yoni's disease and they will spread it. You have to be very careful. In Spain, incidentally, I was just there last year and a couple of years before, their Toro, Toro, you know, the big bulls that they have for bullfighting and they're beautiful bulls. You can walk among them in, uh, when you don't put them in the bull ring, I guess because the farmer did, the veterinarian did, and I did when they were touring me on the, on the farm. Many of them are skin and bones from Yonis and they're contaminating the whole pasture and they're not doing much about it. And I, I'm only saying this because I think Spain should do something about it to help their own industry there, but that's something else. Uh, when you look at uh, livers or spleens or any tissue, and you ha have lumps or skin or whatever. Let's see if I get that right. Mm -hmm. This is the underneath the skin of a goat. Uh, underneath the skin, I thought it was a liver. But it's underneath the skin, and this is what it is. And this is demodectic mange. You know, the little mange, the, the mange that dogs get, demodectic mange. Uh, and those are colonies of millions, I guess, of demodectic mange. <clears throat> this is a nice entity uh, in the skin. Dermatophilosis, uh, it's a bacterial infection in the skin. And we see it in ang uh, 
our beef cows that are shipped to Africa or any place where the animals get, they get a little too much moisture and they get a little too hot, the organism will grow in the skin and make this lesion. And you turn it over and it looks the same. It looks like there's some infection. Well, there's a darn good one with this dermatophilosis. Now this is a very difficult one for you to understand. Here's the lamb's belly button. He's been licked pretty good by his, his mother. Here's a leg and here's, a, here's a, uh, its tail or other leg. But what is this big lump? The farmer said, oh, well, this is from being born. And we see it in a lot of the lambs. Now the catch is, it's a hernia down in the inguinal region of this lamb. I guess that's the other leg and, and uh, hind legs are spread apart and that's a picture of his belly. But why should he have this big hernia? It's bluish because it's a little anoxic. Well, this is the reason here. And if you work at it pretty hard, you can probably make it out. Uh, that's still in the carcass, but I've pulled it out to show you. And what you're looking at is one dead-ended piece of gut here. Well, that's okay. Next, that actually isn't that piece of gut. This is the abomasum, and this is the pylorus and duodenum. But look at this piece of gut. It has nothing in it because that's a piece of the small, uh, small intestine. The rest of this is all small intestine, but there's no ingesta in here. There's no food in here or mecomium, the fetal feces, because here's the blind sac. This blind sac should be attached to here, and then the feces would go out, even in utero. But this is a segmental aplasia. There's a segment of gut between this dead end empty bowel and this fill bowel right here. And when you get so much feces in there and the material cannot leak out into the amnion, uh, the bowel fill up and you'll have a great big abdomen. And during parturition, while you're being born, these pieces of gut will be pushed into that inguinal ring area and you'll get the rupture the uh, rupture of the inguinal hernia. <clears throat> Another thing you want to look at is this is a dry processus urethra uh, on the end of the penis of a, of a ram and that little round lump is a calculus. It occurs here quite commonly and you must tell the young pathologists who come in the postmortem room, check the processus urethra. Well, they might look or might think they look, but many times this thing will go down here part way and block here, or it might get blocked someplace else, back. But always check the processus urethra in the, in the rams and the goats, because if you just cut that off, you could have saved his life. Oh, I should also tell you, interesting enough, that sometimes just a bit of fibrin that can be passed. Doesn't have to be a hard stone, but just a piece of fibrin can go down there, be slightly elongated, but it won't pass out, and it'll block him and kill him too. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a hard stone, and that's why many people miss that diagnosis, because they don't feel a hard lump. It's soft, but remember, fibrin can do it. Here's another one, and here's another sheep with a different disease. He has diarrhea. And uh, here's all the diarrhea around the re rear end. And this is one or two percent, three, maybe five percent, five animals out of a hundred lambs with diarrhea and no good reason. And they're young lambs. They're a little bit too young to get Yoni's disease. And you have to worry, what is this disease? Well, this is called Wiener colitis. And maybe you can read this sign. Goon Noor. G-O-O-N, Goon Noor, I, I guess it's in focus, but anyhow, Goon Noor, and the Australians called it Goon Noor Grot, Grot, G-R-O-T, they have funny accents, but the Goon Noor probably is an Aboriginal name, 
But anyhow, that's where it came from, a farm down in Gunur. And they called it that for years until they found out that it was a uh, specific organism, the name of which I've forgotten, uh, that causes a, uh, a colon uh, malabsorption, colonic malabsorption and they will start getting diarrhea. Uh, great lesion. And the, here we go again. We've got uh, pigment all over the place, just like in dogs and cats. You better worry, worry about having a malignant melanoma. At first, when you look at it, you could say, gee, it's, it's flukes, and it could be. But don't forget, you have melanomas in them also. This is a very difficult picture for you to recognize. But it's got lots of scarring in here, lots of scarring, and you don't have the normal villi that line the rumen. So you're looking at rumen scarring with no villi. And this, of, this is uh, overeating disease where they overeat on grain far too much. And when they overeat on grain, the organisms will make lactic acid and it'll burn the heck out of their rumen. At least I believe that's a pathogenesis. They, they burn their room and wall, but it got better. But some of these animals will never do as well as others, and you have to worry about that. A common cause of this is if it's Australian sheep, for instance, or American sheep, they, uh, they just lambed, and you might feed them too much grain. The other thing is on the ships that they ship you know, 100,000 sheep to Saudi Arabia from Australia for the, uh, for the uh, Arab trade. <clears throat> uh, the sheep are cheap. They want to kill the sheep in, in the Arab land so that they know it's killed by the halal method. So it's, you know, it's same as kind of like kosher. Uh, they feed them only once a day on those big ships. And that's good grain, good mix. And they will get a lot of this, 80% of the sheep that were sent to Saudi Arabia while I was there all had would have a degree of ruminitis from overeating. I'm not sure if you rec this is just fat and guts and here's this hemorrhage with a little little pale opaque around the hemorrhage. This is ketotic fat necrosis and ketotic fat necrosis is the animal is suddenly off feed and then he must use his fat in order to uh, get, uh, get some energy. And when he does that with a limited uh, active acetate or glucose, he will develop these <clears throat> areas of ketotic fat necrosis. That's what it looks like histologically. Little fat adipose tissue cells here, and little ketotic fat soap formation, so to speak. Uh, this is a great big lump on that guy's head. This is another manifestation of, see the big lump? And this is a great big elbow and all that. This is another manifestation of CAE virus infection, caprine arthritis encephalitis infection. These are lambs and they have frostbite. I'm not showing it to you too good, but frostbite in, uh, in the legs just because the old lady didn't lick it well and she might have abandoned it or something like that. It's cold and they will get frostbite. I think I showed you this yesterday. These are copper coated little calculi in the urinary bladder. When you first look at them, I showed them yesterday from the black box. When you first look at them, you say, well, those are BBs because they're copper and shiny, but they're all different sizes. And it's just the calcium phosphorus appetite with a a copper coat. Pigmentation in the kidney, uh, you see it better in cats, but it's just pigment, cal uh, pigment calculi in the urinary bladder. What kind of pigment? Uh, anything that made a little bit of ictris or hemolysis, in intravascular hemolysis, it's eliminated in the kidney and it can certainly form calculi. Nothing special. These are hookworm hickeys and I use the term because I'm kind of kidding, but their hookworms are in this animal and they'll bite the, they bite the mucosa 
uh, put out a little bit of uh, put out a little bit of hyrudin, and the tissue continues to bleed, and we call it hookworm hookworm hickeys. This is a very interesting lesion, and I show it to you better in pigs because that's where I have the better pictures. But animals that step on other animals, especially in the flank, remember the flank, because the flank will trap a hoof and the old lady can step on it. She's not likely to, not the mother, but other animals can step on the baby, especially the males, the bigger males if they're around, and they will step, will step on the gut through the abdominal wall onto the hard floor and will and, and it'll bisect that gut wall very easily. <clears throat> now you're looking at the mammary gland uh, of a couple sheep, and here's the teats here, and here's the other teat, and uh, I guess the teats on this one here, I don't know where the other one is at the moment. Uh, but that's blue bag, and some people say it's caused by Staphylococcus, and we get per, pure culture of Staphylococcus on some, and we also see it in pastorella. So pastorella mastitis in sheep, and it can kill a whole bunch of the ewes if you really don't separate them and prevent them from uh, cross-contamination, I guess. As you uh, can see in the background, I have a green background. That's a foot mat in Taiwan. So that tells me where I took the picture. But I'm also, uh, I'd like to say at this time, this is just a little aside, that they've got one of the best working crews you've ever worked with at the AFIP, and that's who's helping me uh, do, make all these things. It's a fantastic crew, much appreciated. And even better yet, one of them said, you know, your backgrounds of blue are one of the best he's ever worked with. So maybe that's why I've been doing that. No, it isn't, but I'm glad to know he thinks so. Anyhow, what you're looking at here is a, uh, a ham from a pig in Taiwan. And you want to see that the red muscle is essentially normal muscle, and all the rest of it looks parboiled. Well, this is a nice entity called PSS, porcine stress syndrome. And you've got all this little edema that helps make the diagnosis. Now we'll continue. And this is uh, PSS. There's a little paleness to the muscle. It's not easy to see, but you know the pig died with acute rigor mortis. Some of the pigs darn near die in rigor mortis. They go, they have a high fever, and they die exceptionally quick. And what you're looking for are small adrenal glands. Sometimes they are not small in size, but in almost always they are small in weight or, you know, decreased weight. The average pig that's uh, four, six hundred pounds should have about a 40 gram adrenal. And when they have this disease, the adrenal is about uh, eight, ten, twelve grams instead of 35 or 40. The pig dies catastrophically sudden, and at 600 pounds you got a problem. And many of the veterinarians who are doing the autopsies will say, oh, he's bloated. Well, they bloat a little bit because they got all that gas in their belly. So it's a nice entity, and this is a dark adrenal. Well, the adrenals of normal pigs are not dark. They're pale, and this is a small adrenal, and it's very diagnostic for PSS. The relationship to the disease entity is that you can see this in young pigs. Before they have died, they, you've killed them for some other reason. So it's a neat thing to find, to make the diagnosis. And in my opinion, this is a genetic disease and you must cull the mother and the father from one or the other because somebody's spreading the disease. And you usually see it in the long pigs, the bacon pigs. Many of them are white, the white pigs. Uh, so that's PSS. And that's when I was in Taiwan in 1975, so you can see that. And you do a lot of uh, adrenal weights, and 
the normal pigs have pretty good size and heavy adrenals and the affected ones are small and they've got weights and all that but I'm just showing you that you just can't tell by looking you must weigh them very important and we had lots of them so it's not too hard to figure it out mm -hmm. this is something I've only seen it in the pig and uh, I've I pickled a couple of them from museums and when I went to when I went to uh, Guelph they had one that I had put up in Cornell and Cornell got rid of the whole museum probably there were about 4,000 fabulous specimens and I'd probably put up 2,000 of them and they had given them all away but at least Guelph saved one and they had one of their own and what you're looking at is this lump of tissue which is the capsule of the spleen this spleen is completely dead because it had twisted uh, tors on itself and became it died and then it died but it wasn't infected so it developed its own capsule this is a stomach over here <clears throat> here's another one it's pretty pretty ugly actually but this is a spleen and I put a paper towel underneath it and this is its capsule that developed uh, that had all that necrotic in there and it stimulated its size a little bit here's another one and this is from uh, this is Lois Ross picture from Boston and uh, I don't know what she used for background but there's the spleen that's dead and this is a sack that it was in so this is a uh, you know torsion of the spleen in pigs I've not seen it in other species in 35 years the other day I showed you this in the in the dogs and it's in foals it's in many species I only showed it to you in a dog but here it is in a pig and this is a uh, rugal hypertrophy rugal hyperplasia gastric hyperplasia whatever name you want to give uh, nobody knows the cause we don't know the cause this of course is a pylorus right down through here and this is a torus pyloricus that's a a normal structure in a pig but many people have never seen it you can see it in cows too and even in horses but it's not as as uh, discreet so you might not make it and this of course the duodenum with a little pseudomelanosis mm -hmm. and you know this is a pig for one reason you do not see this in other species and that is the nice big round ep epiglottis so you know it's a pig but I'm showing you this because it has this tongue lesion here that tongue is a epithelial defect of the tongue in baby pigs and if you like like them here's a whole bunch more in baby pigs and you know they're pigs because of the, uh, that picture is probably older than anybody in the room except me and maybe anyhow the fellow buried these pigs and he said well, the whole litter died he thought they died with the same thing so I went to the farm and dug up the whole litter because he had put it in a little burlap sack and buried it alongside the railroad track and I went and dug it up and uh, the maggots were still growing on it because it only been buried a couple days but all the pigs had this lesion epithelial defect so I conned the farmer into breeding the sow uh, to the same boar again hoping I could reproduce it and uh, I said I'd, ba I'd pay for the baby pigs and uh, breeding and all that but nothing happened there the next litter were born healthy here's another one just to keep you honest mm -hmm. many times a common lesion in the horse which I didn't show the other day because it's so common I wanted to show you unique things is idiopathic hypertrophy of the distal esophagus and that's this horse here and it starts being normal here but that's idiopathic hypertrophy in the horse but that's also idiopathic hypertrophy in the pig so that makes it a little different lesion that's why I'm showing it to you <clears throat> now this is a fantastic entity it's very many people have seen it most people have never recognized it and you've got to work at it to make sure what you see you're going to look at three things normal gut compromised bowel and another normal piece right here 
and this is what you're looking at. I've just turned it over a little bit, and here's the infarcted bowel. Here's a normal bowel, and here's, and here's a normal piece coming out, going that way, going that way. And this is an intestinal knotting, K-N-O-T-T-I-N-G. To try to explain it, it's not easy, but I'll show it to you. Here's normal bowel here and normal here. Here's infarcted or dead bowel here, infarcted or dead bowel here, and the piece in between is essentially normal. Congested, but essentially normal. And this is how you explain it. You take two loops of intestine with the mesentery on the inside, and you just wrap those two. And when you wrap those two, that's what you get. This piece is still alive, and that's that one piece in the middle. This becomes infarcted, and that becomes infarcted. And these are the normal pieces. And there's no hole in the mesentery, because a lot of people say, oh, it's got a, a hole in the mesentery, a hernia ring, which the content goes through. But there's no hole in the mesentery. So that's the new concept here. Uh, mostly in dogs, but I beg your pardon, probably mostly in pigs. And that's this lymphangitis in the pig. And we've gotten streptococcal, streptococcus out of some, but it's not that. Uh, you can see all of this irritation, hemorrhage, irritation and hemorrhage uh, as a result of a lymphangitis in the pig. Now this is a great one. When you reach in, when you're doing the autopsy, you reach in to grab the esophagus to prevent, uh, when you cut the esophagus off the diaphragm, to prevent ingesta getting all over the abdomen. You will feel a thick stomach wall. You can see it here because of this increased blood supply. So, you know, that's, uh, uh, <clears throat> I forgot the name. I've used it the last couple of days. Uh, but that's collateral circulation effect, Medusa head uh, vasculitis, because this guy has a gastric ulcer. And when you look at this gastric ulcer, it almost always occurs in the stratified squamous portion of the stomach. And here's a blood clot. If you do the autopsy on this pig, it's going to smell like cider, fermented apples. Characteristically, you walk in the postmortem room when somebody's doing this pig, and that's exactly what you will smell, fermented apples. And now if you work hard at it, you will look in this region. Here's the esophagus right here, and here's the region that's completely ulcerated. And these are called gastric ulcers. Here's the esophagus right there, and this is completely lost. It's the epithelial portion of the stomach wall, the mucosa. It's complete, and these guys will bleed to death either as a big lump or, or as uh, go down the gut. <clears throat> now, what do you see here? This is where the esophagus came in, and this is almost all healed, and there's just a little bit of epithelium here, but that's the only opening for food. So when this guy goes on to solid food, he's either going to get some of it down and vomit the rest up, or he's going to start going hungry because he knows he can't eat solid food. So he'll drink a lot of water and milk and live, or maybe he will, so they can live for a long time uh, on, on liquid food, but he'll probably die because you don't want pigs that are skinny. Now here's another pig, almost no epithelium here, and I showed you the area that it should be. The other thing you should remember that most of these, most of these areas that are affected have a square nature to them, because that's the stratified squamous portion of the stomach. It's square-ish, and you should recognize that as that kind of ulcer. This one's almost healed. Uh, this one's almost healed. Different pigs, of course. And what do you see here? Beautiful English. It ain't got no stratified squamous epithelium. It's completely gone, and the, the glandular portion has healed up to, the, up to the esophageal mucosa. And that squamous portion is completely gone, and you wouldn't recognize that as a gastric ulcer, which had healed, if you're not aware of what I've just told you. 
uh, four different pigs and they're all just laid out. Massive hemorrhage in the chest, massive hemorrhage around this hind leg, around this hind leg, again up underneath the armpit. And I know, here's the hind legs, massive hemorrhage, they've bled out. Oh shucks. Okay. And what makes these pigs bleed to death? Well, lots of things can make animals bleed to death. And I'm, I was sure, well, they're stabbing them in the legs when they pick them up by the hind legs to vaccinate them. But that's not what happened. These pigs uh, might have been handled, but if they stab them back here, what are they doing bleeding into the chest? This is a vitamin K deficiency because of the improper the improper storage of feed. The vitamin K is destroyed in storage. And all we did to cure that in Taiwan, I guess they lost 2,100 pigs before I told them it was vitamin K. And they just give them vitamin K and that helps them. Now when you pick this pig up, this pig could weigh uh, 50 or 60 pounds or it could weigh 12 pounds. And it's two different diseases. One of them is he's gas filled because he's got a little peritonitis with gas formation. Or the other is he's just full of feces. And I'll show you why. If you look at this one, this guy is full of feces and he's dead. And you can see the lines here. Well, the only thing if you looked at any pig and you wanted to see great big lines like this, you would look at the spiral colon. And that's what you're looking at. And this spiral colon is full of feces. And that's, and look, it all goes all the way back. This is a colon. This is a rectum. Because he has, in my humble opinion, what is a congenital anomaly. Because it's always in the same location. It looks the same. Most of the time you can't culture something from it worth a darn. The Australians say they never culture anything from it. Uh, at least uh, like has been reported. This is an added attraction. To many of those intestines, you will have all of these dilated lymphatics on the surface. And with time, when you have dilated lymphatics, <clears throat> you should think like uh, people who have elephantiasis, uh, wincheria, oh, that might be the parasite, uh, Gee, I forgot the name of it or something. It's a parasite that gets in your lymphatics in the legs, blocks those lymphatics, the lymphatics fill up with fluid and you get uh, fibrosis and edema or edema and then fibrosis of the legs. And the only way to get rid of that is to cut your legs off. Um, well, you're not going to do that likely. So the connective tissue that forms because of the chronic uh, lymphatic stasis is is terrible. You can't get rid of it. Here it is again as it's more chronic and you can see it's now connective tissue. This is not evidence for inflammation. It's just evidence for lymphatic obstruction. I was in Switzerland. I had a big argument with another, the same fella about uh, pigs and uh, he got angry and hollered at me a little bit and I hollered back and that it went downhill from there. But he was stubborn and I was just as stubborn. Anyhow, this is, this is not inflammation, this is just fibrotic uh, steno uh, damage to the lymphatics. Now here's another pig with the same disease. He might have some adhesions here or that just might be mesentery. But what you're looking at is this is the cause of these cases. They're always the same and you better remember it. This is the rectum itself, the anus proper and the rectum's coming back this way. The first couple of centimeters are normal. The next few centimeters going forward have no epithelium and then it causes, and then when the feces passes, the meconium that passes is sterile. Doesn't hurt them much. But when they start eating normal food, normal bacteria, and they get inflammation, that'll cause massive ulceration here. And this is normal mucosa, but just congested. Don't worry about it. Here's another one, up close. Here's the anus, here's the rectum. First couple of centimeters are normal mucosa lining. 
Then here, this is all ulcerated because the gut is dilated and the epithelialization can't cover it quick enough so you get granulomatous. And then this is all the hypertrophied remaining bowel going forward. Don't go away mad because here's two in one day and this is in Australia because when I was down there, you find them in their little pigs. The normal anus is down here, right here. And then the normal mucosa for a little way. And then you start getting all this ulcerated area. Another pig with the same thing. That might not be the, the ulcerated area will be here. Here's the ulcerated here. The normal mucosa right here. It's constricted here because that's where it starts. And here's a couple more. Here's the, the anus is right here. And here's a normal mucosa. Anus is here, normal mucosa. And then it's constricted because that's the longest part that had no epithelium. And then it causes the rest of the gut to swell up. So this is an epithelial defect, and a lot of people say it's Salmonella typhimurium or something like that. I don't believe it, uh, and Australians don't believe it, but you can, do, you can do what you want on that. And I think you should just cut the throats of the mothers and fathers. At Cornell we have, and we don't see this disease anymore. Mm -hmm. Then when you get this thing, somebody brought it into us, the tail and the rear end of a pig, it's all torn up. And somebody says, oh, that's because the other pigs are chewing on them. And other pigs will, out of boredom. If you have one pig in the pen of 50 pigs with a tail, then you know he's a tail biter because he's bitten all the other 50 tails off and nobody's bitten his off. So that happens. But I said, oh, no, look at his tail. It's still there and this is all torn out. But you keep working at it. Here's another one with a torn, with a torn anus. Well, you could think of sodomy or something like that with stupid people, but they wouldn't do that to little pigs. They're not going to get there, and the pigs would raise Cain just being among them. But you must think of something else like that, and in one of these pins, that's out of focus. Don't worry about it. You can't change that focus. Uh, I moved while I was taking it because it wasn't much light. But anyhow, there's a nail sticking out, and it was just about anus high. And these pigs are all crowded in here. He's out of business now. But they're all crowded in here, and a pig would back up into the nail. And when he tries to get away, the other pigs don't let him, and he kind of wiggles around and, and really ruins himself. So that's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a new entity for you. Not so new. Uh, when I say new, newly recognized or newly researched or something. Look at those ears. They're going to dry up after a while because they're going to become necrotic. Now, what would do that? Look at these ears. Both of them are dried and, and dead, and the pig is dead from the backside. Most of you say this is because he has a vegetative endocarditis in the left heart that goes out the aorta. It goes towards the carotid arteries. It breaks in half perfectly, and one goes up the left and one up the right carotid. And then when it gets up to the internal carotids, or common carotid, when it gets up to the internal carotids or something, it breaks and both go up the same vessel towards the ear. And then when it gets up to the auricular vessels, they again go up the same vessels and they cause the disease in both ears at relatively the same time. Well, that's so highly unlikely almost statistically impossible, it's not likely to happen. So that's probably not the reason. So don't let anybody tell you it is due to emboli from the heart. What you should do is consider, oops, you should consider that these are a manifestation of core temperature gangrene. When the pig gets vegetative endocarditis, he gets a fever, and when he gets fever, for any length of time, he'll get peripheral vasoconstriction. He will lose his tails and his tail and his ears, all because of this core temperature gangrene process. Uh, and it occurs in the summertime, so it isn't frost. And it occurs without vegetative endocarditis. So you can't blame it on that. But it's, it's so imbued in everybody's mind, well, it's erysipelas or something like that, vegetative endocarditis, don't believe it, at least in my opinion. And these are little red pigs, and little red pigs commonly have uh, 
Durox commonly have malignant melanomas. Some of these go away and some of them develop later. Now, what do you think of this guy? He's got malignant melanomas too. But this is a fancy breeding area. He's got testicles, a fancy breeding farm, and they're not supposed to have any red pigs in their genetic line. But this pig probably does have, and nobody knows the difference. I showed you these pieces of bone yesterday in my, from my black box, or bones like it. These are the mesenteric bones that you see in the abdominal cavity. And you don't see them, you can't see them here, but they're here. You palpate those scars and you'll get little pieces of bone out of them. Nobody knows why they form. And here they are again, little pieces of bone. And nobody knows why they're there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. More of the same. Just to tell you, I'm not inventing these things. Uh, and here's a pig stepped on. And he's got a, he's got a absolute you know, transection of the bowel. Now remember, pigs are dumb animals, but mama pigs aren't quite that dumb. Mother Nature makes them so they don't step on their babies. How, it, because if they step on their head, they've got four legs, she won't press down on that baby pig's head. If they step on a rib cage, they won't, they won't put all their weight on it, won't hurt them. If they step on their hind quarters, they won't hurt them. I mean, they won't continue stepping, they feel it and they'll move away. But if they step into the flank, right at that Viborg's tri triangle or some triangle, I've forgotten the name, when they step on that, that's just behind the ribs, just in front of the pelvis, there's a triangle there that is soft and the mother might think that is just feces and because she can't look around or something like that, she might continue stepping. And when she does, she will press the gut between her foot and the floor and transect it. The reason to tell you this is that if you want to prove it, you must skin the, you must skin that part of the flank on either side to see where there's also hemorrhage and trauma in the, in the lining of the flank right there. Because it'll have good peritonitis because of this rupture and have this damage. But you must skin the, the flank to see the lesion also there, and then you'll have good evidence that that's what caused it. Not, you don't see it in every case, but most every case you do. Uh, if you want brain heart syndrome in, in pigs, you know, where you have neurogenic cardiomyopathy, that's what you'll see neurogenic cardiomyopathy, you cut the heart and section it, you'll see in this case lots of mineralization, a few inflammatory cells. This is brain heart syndrome that you can see with trauma to the brain, spinal cord, or major nerves, or twisted stomachs, but you don't see that in pigs. Sometimes renal disease, I've never seen it in pigs, but most of the time this is brain heart syndrome. It usually does not kill them. It is there, but it usually doesn't kill them. What you're looking at here is a greatly dilated heart, no vegetative endocarditis, and he's got a nutmeg liver. Doesn't look as nutmeg as others because this is more congestion and all. But here's another one with a good nutmeg liver, and he's got a massively dilated heart. Well, this is cardiomyopathy of pigs. Nobody knows its true cause. I don't know. But pigs get cardiomyopathy just like cats do. And woodchucks. Woodchucks, I think, even have more cardiomyopathy than cats have with aortic thrombosis and all of the works. But here it is in a pig with a nutmeg liver. Uh, another pig with cardiomyopathy, greatly dilated heart, great dilated Atria. Yesterday I tried to drive this point home. Many ears of corn have mycotoxins, but that might be just normal mold growing under proper conditions that didn't make any mycotoxins because all moldy corn isn't toxic because the temperature, the moisture content, and all that stuff 
did not stimulate the growth of a mold to make aflatoxin G or B or F or whatever the heck it is. All molds aren't toxic. If they were, you'd never eat Swiss cheese and other stuff like that. Uh, but uh, under the wrong growing conditions, if the, if the refrigeration goes off or you get a different culture in there by mistake, you might get toxins. Mm. We p talk about lungs all the time uh, because they're kind of diagnostic. A cranial ventral pneumonia in a pig, and that could be severe inhalation. It could be mycoplasma, acute mycoplasma pneumonia. Uh, it could be Bordetella, bronchoseptica pneumonia. I can't tell it. This is Bordetella. But those are about the three most common pneumonias we would see in a young pig, mycoplasma or Bordetella. And you can't tell them apart always. We're continuing with the pneumonias. This is a great new, not new, it's uh, not new, at least uh, these pictures from 1976, I guess. Anyhow, this is, when I was over in uh, uh, Taiwan, I all of a sudden started seeing many pneumonias like this. Large, locally extensive, hot, very, uh, congested and hemorrhagic pneumonias. And this is was Haemophilus. Uh, now I guess they might have changed the name to Actinobacillus pleuropneumoniae or gee, I don't know what the name is at the moment. Anyhow, this is a wicked pneumonia. At first we cultured what we called Haemophilus parahemolyticus and hemoglobinophilus and things like that. It's a characteristic pneumonia. You palpate it it's going to be firm here and here and here. And these areas, acute hemorrhagic fibrinous pneumonia in a pig. That's what you're looking at. It looks like pastorella. It's not. It's uh, tinobacillus or whatever the new name for hemophilus is. Here it is more. It's leaving, sometimes it leaves the apical lobes alone. But it's very characteristic. You won't mistake it for almost any other. Lots of hemorrhage underneath and surface fibrin. Very characteristic, very severe, and very economically important in places where you have a lot of, of uh, pigs. Where, whereas to be differentiated from this, this is a cranial ventral pneumonia, very firm, and it's, this is uh, mycoplasma pneumonia. The English at first called it uh, virus pneumonia pigs, but they finally learned it was hemophilus. Uh, in Dunn's book on uh, diseases of pig, one picture's in there under virus, and the same picture's in there in the next edition or something in the mycoplasma. Uh, a lot of that early work, you know, they were pretty sure of it. They've had to change their mind, but, you know, there's so many people in business who aren't working too hard, and like microbiologists work hard, but they keep changing names, and that really is confusing to us older uh, pathologists. But you can't fight it, that's progress. When you see a lung like this, you better be thinking it's so bad, a good thing or the best thing would be inhalation pneumonia for whatever reason. A nice little new lesion that you see is, here's the, again Taiwan, this is a prepuce. And these are almost, they look like, they look like uh, caruncles or colitons and uh, in the placenta. Well, it's beautiful infected material, but we haven't got the, it's polyurea plasm. Uh, I only had a few pictures at the time, I've seen a lot since, but we hadn't cultured it. And urea plasm probably. Here's another prepuce with the same type of lesions like you see in the uh, uh, placenta. Here they are with a little chronic, these are all prepuce. More of the same, prepucial lesions. And they're, the, I guess they're the lymphatic areas that are undergoing degeneration with this infection. Now, I know this is argumentative throughout the world. And be my guest. You can tell me it's Bordetella infection if you want to. But most of the time when you see these atrophic 
rhinitis lesions. They're bilaterally symmetrical and dorsal and ventrally uh, and side to side. Well, I don't believe that fits most infectious agents. And many times you section these, there is no appreciable inflammation or cellular response. So this is Taiwan, here's the end of a day, and I just cut the noses apart, bilaterally symmetrical, bilateral, 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 dorsal and ventral, bilateral, dorsal and ventral, bilateral, dorsal and ventral. That doesn't fit a local bacterial infection. And now you're going to tell me, oh, well, it's an endotoxin from Pastorella. I don't quite believe that either. However, you think of it the way you want to. And here's a week's work. In Taiwan, when you do a lot of pigs, you see one heck of a lot of snouts. And here's one unilateral, unilateral, unilateral. Well, there's no argument you can get secondary bacterial infection. No Pastorella or Fusobacterium necroforum. I'm not against that. Here's bullnose, you know, Fusobacterium necroforum. And that rotates the nose. But it could have been started by, by uh, atrophic rhinitis. Anyhow, at Cornell, Kruk has stopped this disease by just giving them more calcium in the diet. And in Taiwan, on the farms where they listened to me, they just increased the calcium. Nothing else was done, and it seems to stop the atrophic rhinitis. So that's what I believe causes it, but you're welcome to your opinion.